So good evening, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, one can sense that the pujas are approaching uh, because uh, gradually, over the last two or three events, the, the uh, audience has been thinning a little bit, you see. So the puja spirit is kind of taking over. Uh, uh, otherwise, usually we have packed houses over here. Uh, I think uh, the puja spirit, shopping, for those who have the money, uh, and uh, coupled with that, the prospect of huge traffic jams possibly desist people from venturing out uh, during this period. Uh, nevertheless, for those who have come here, a very good evening. Today you will hear a lecture on new minds, new bodies, Bengal and colonial geographies. Our speaker this evening is Anindita Mukhopadhyay, Professor of History, University of Hyderabad. Some people did ask me, uh, what is she going to speak about from the title? You see, new minds, new bodies. And then in the uh, e-card, they saw some apes, images of apes over there. So I said, these are questions best asked to the speaker when she comes here. So, and possibly some people will do, but may not be necessary after she has spoken to you. Uh, but before uh, she takes the microphone, I would like to request Dr. Jayantushan Gupta to kindly introduce the speaker to the audience. Good evening, and welcome to this evening's lecture on New Minds, New Bodies, Bengal and Colonial Geographies by my longtime friend, Anindita Mukhopadhyay. Uh, we were contemporaries in college, and uh, that was a really long time ago. I'm not going to say how many years ago, but it was years and years ago. Uh, so it's not only a pleasure, not only a pleasure to invite a longtime friend to Victoria Memorial Hall, but it's also a privilege to invite one of our finest scholars on cultural and intellectual history of colonial Bengal and India. Uh, now, a professor of history at the University of Hyderabad, Professor Anindita Mukhopadhyay, was educated at Presidency College, uh, JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and the School of Oriental and African Studies of the University of London, from where she obtained her PhD. Her dissertation, her doctoral dissertation, eventually grew into her first book titled Behind the Mask, the Cultural Definition of the Legal Subject in Colonial Bengal, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2006 and provided a deep exploration of the complex interlinkages between the formulation of middle class identity, colonial legal discourse, and class antagonism between late 18th and early 20th century in Bengal. Her second book, titled Children's Games, Adults' Gambits from Vidyasagar, to Shottujit Rai, published by Orient Black Swan earlier this year. And I had the privilege of reading that book and participating in a discussion centered on it shortly thereafter. It offers a fascinating account of how childhood was depicted by leading literary figures in Bengal, some of whom also wrote for children. Colonial Bengal saw the opening up of the metropolitan space of the West and the Bengali educated elite reoriented their understanding of the world and of themselves in relation to these new Western spaces through books and textbooks that included depictions of the new lands. And we have, many of us have wrote, read those, these books growing up. Uh, childhood thus became the foundation for building the new understanding of the world and the self. When I read Anindita's book, I was left with no doubt that she must come here and speak. So here she is tonight. Uh, <clears throat> and I expect some of her fascinating insights from her second book to feature in tonight's lecture as well. So that's all I have to say. Like all of you, I'm looking forward to a fascinating lecture. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Onindita Mukhopadhyay to speak on new minds, new bodies, Bengal in colonial geographies. On And before she takes the microphone, would you kindly yes. do the honors of uh, handing over a small memento on behalf of Victoria Memorial Hall to the speaker of this evening. Uh, 
Uh, and before she starts again, as usual, I will have to request you to please put your mobile phones on silent or switch them off, please. Uh, I'm extremely proud to be here today uh, speaking on my book. I uh, give my uh, thanks and gratitude to Janta for making this possible at all. And uh, I also uh, uh, felt that I had been extended wonderful hospitality in one of the, one of the most uh, uh, beautiful uh, environment that I, uh, that, I, that I have ever seen in Kolkata. I didn't expect the uh, gardens of uh, Victoria Memorial to be, so, to, to be so beautiful and verdant. Um, <clears throat> um, as I came in uh, through the gates, uh, I saw um, that Victoria Memorial is celebrating the 27th, um, on the 27th of September, uh, which is today, uh, a, a tourist's day. And it seemed very apt that uh, as Victoria Memorial celebrates tourist's day, I'll be speaking on geographies. Because the way we understand and have normalized our understanding of geographies today, where travelers from uh, all parts of India um, think about uh, not just the national space, but also the international space as places to which they can go to with impunity, with, with, uh, uh, no, with no holes barred. But this was actually not the case in the 18th and 19th centuries. And I would, though I am limited by my discipline, I happen to be a podgy, stodgy historian. And I really do not uh, have the, uh, the, the fly-past uh, techniques of political scientists or sociologists who, uh, on the basis of one case study, can draw huge generalizations and they can, and they can uh, uh, you know, posit, posit uh, a way of looking at the world through just one prism. I, unfortunately, uh, uh, am stuck with Bengal as my case study, but I'm hoping that you will see uh, that, that there is a similar um, uh, uh, development in other uh, regions as well in India, because Bengal doesn't share this unfamiliarity with, with uh, uh, space, uh, with geography. Um, uh, there are uh, almost all the regions, uh, including um, uh, the areas that were uh, engaged in maritime, <clears throat> activities uh, where uh, even in these uh, regions, uh, geographies did not have the crystal clarity that today's tourist uh, enjoys, right? So there is this uh, uh, very strange shift and, as I said, a normalization of what we see, what we know about the world, which obviously seems to be spun from today's position, right? But as I said, this was actually completely different when we uh, shift our lenses back to the uh, 17th and 18th centuries, where the notions of geographies as we understand it today was completely missing in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, <clears throat> So I will, uh, I will uh, uh, begin with this point uh, about, about what makes these geographies become familiar and what makes uh, the, the way, the, way uh, uh, the world appears through wild animals, through dangerous animals, through, through uh, 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 dangerous landscapes, uh, inhospitable uh, environment. Uh, these uh, very, uh, uh, you know, again, these very um, normalized facts, material facts about the world were also conspicuous by their absence in the 18th and 19th centuries. How then, uh, and this is the question that I uh, will be uh, turning on uh, again and again, how then, by the 1930s, we have a series of adventure stories where uh, the, the uh, adventures of 
a young Bengali um, uh, duo uh, uh, were were uh, were, spa were were turned on or were 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 located in uh, the dangerous spaces in um, India. So that would be the Assam. Uh, uh, forests, uh, uh, the dangerous spaces in Africa that would really be Africa, uh, uh, the the unknown spaces of Mars, right? So these are uh, the explorations as as the uh, Bengali uh, uh, spirit of adventure understood the uh, opening up of the world through the eyes, of course, of uh, young male protagonists, right? But from the 18th century, uh, uh, you know, a, a big gap has opened up by the 1930s when the understanding of the world seemed to be uh, 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 something which was which was a given, and the first move to this to this uh, point, right, will be through a series of. Um, uh, historical historical explorations of the archives and the libraries to show uh, the assembled company how this was achieved, what actually made the material facticity of the world, as it were, become part of a, a very new imagination. Against this, I'm also going to ask the audience to consider some very important points. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I would also, along with this jump that we are going to make from the uh, 18th century um, uh, understanding of a lack of awareness about the uh, global location uh, to the 1930s and the arrival of Hemendra Kumar Roy, where Young readers, and, and from his uh, letters, even adult readers, somehow seem to read the world through these books. They know exactly where uh, Mars is. They know exactly uh, where Africa is. They know uh, what, the, what the wildlife of Africa uh, would mean, like gorillas, right? Okay. <laughs> And uh, they also would know uh, the various difficult uh, uh, terrains of the Indian subcontinent, right? Okay, so this, this is one jump. The other jump, which I will not address in this, in this particular um, presentation, is the jump of the body. The body, as we all have forgotten, in the 18th century, or even say the 17th century, definitely by the 19th century, which is which is the uh, period when you compare different regions of uh, uh, India and see that there is a similarity in the way the body is drawn up. I'm not going to look at the bodies of untouchables. I'm not going to look at the bodies of the underprivileged communities. Neither am I going to look at the bodies of women. Right. I'm only going to look at the bodies in very, very, you know, very brief aside. I'm only going to look at the bodies of the uh, privileged uh, male upper caste um, uh, individual, and I'm going to show that even in the 18th century or or 19th century, there was a boundedness to the body, to the to the male body. Uh, upper castes were tied in by rituals, by castes, by notions of purity and pollution, by uh, the very, the very uh, cosmic uh, 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 control over over their everyday lives, which would make their spaces constrained. Against this, I would like to say that there is in um, the fiction of the 1930s, as, uh, as uh, portrayed so brilliantly by Hemendra Kumar Roy, um, there is a leap uh, of a freed male body. These bodies, I hope you will refer back to the books that you may have read. I'm sure you have all read. But, but 
even if you have missed out on Hemendra Kumar Roy, I would like you to very quickly uh, 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 ransack your memories for Satyajit Ray's works. And in those works, you will find that there is a very, uh, a very um, uh, uh, sharp um, sliding over the fact that the 18th century or the 19th century male body was constrained. These bodies are free. They are free to uh, eat what they want. They are free to um, have, have uh, uh, no reference to rituals of cleaning. Uh, they are free to move from one space to the other without uh, fearing polluting, polluting environment to uh, contaminate their bodies. Uh, they are also, and very, very importantly, they are also uh, free to move through any kind of space. Right, so we need to understand that there is a very, uh, uh, very uh, obvious lifting of restrictions, of social, cultural, caste restrictions, right? But this is again not the case. Um, uh, uh, there is, uh, from the 19th century onwards, a uh, constant mourning, uh, a constant haunting of uh, uh, the sections, uh, or shall we call them families, uh, who had experienced a certain lifting of this understanding of restrictions, bodily restrictions. And I'm not talking about women, as I've said. Neither am I talking about uh, untouchables or the underprivileged communities. I'm only talking about upper caste uh, 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 male individuals. Uh, we are looking at, um, and I would suggest that again, our historical textbooks, which have familiarized us with certain kinds of histories, uh, should just very quickly refer back to the Young Bengal movement, right? Which was a freedom of the mind and body, right? So you actually have these young, rampant uh, young men uh, literally dancing through the streets of Kolkata, right? Uh, eating and uh, speaking and, and defying um, the caste restrictions on the body and mind. Right. Okay. So I would like to I would like to uh, point at that particular uh, moment, right, which completely outraged the uh, not even the highly orthodox, but even the Hindu reformers like Ram Mohan Roy. The, he was also, in a way, slightly uncomfortable with such with such overt. Um, uh, uh, and arrogant uh, uh, dismissal of age-old caste prejudice around bodies. Bodies also meant two very important freedoms. The first freedom, which we all again seem to have forgotten, is ingestion of food. What we eat um, and this, again, somehow seems to be a modern moment of freedom, right? So I, I, I will be talking, I, just to give you a sense of what I'll be speaking about in other uh, conference halls, I will be talking about two domains later on. I mean, this is coming out of my own arguments, right? I can see only one part one section of a world which is changing. But I have not been able to address in my book, Children's Games, Adults' Gambits, the other aspect which must have changed, right? And that's the world of religion. And I really need to match the world of uh, reality, the world of fiction, which jumps ahead without addressing the method through which this freedom is achieved. Right, so fiction has this amazing ability to, to leap. But the, the, the freedom of the body was not achieved only by fiction. It was also achieved by a, a constant hammering away at this particular social, cultural, religious reality. 
which was a bodily restriction on on um, uh, you know males right on upper caste privileged males right so how this bodily restriction lifts freeing the body along with the freed mind is also a very important modern moment right which again we seem to have uh, 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 inherited uh, from our colonial and post-colonial uh, histories and pasts, but which we haven't really questioned very closely to see how we have actually uh, entered this, this uh, very important understanding of an individuated modern freed body. So I would like to make these two very important points before I come back to the original point of entry, which was how uh, Hemendra Kumar's 1930s Vimal Kumar, Jayanta Manik, all these uh, masculine, uh, uh, you know, duos. All right, I would call them dyads because one always come, you know, they always come attached to the other. Right, so they're dyads. So. Uh, from from what point uh, would Hemendra Kumar Roy assume that the geographies that he is going to talk about will be familiar to the young and the old reader? All right, and these geographies come from a new understanding of I would like to call these deep structures coming along with the colonial uh, rule, coming along with colonial domination in in Bengal and everywhere else in the world, uh, in India at least, right? So the colonialism was a global phenomenon, whether we like it or not, right? Okay, and so uh, colonialism, as it uh, entered into modern minds, our minds, okay, was actually part of a new schooling system. I feel that we have not really addressed the educational policies and the educational schooling systems the way we should have. Because we are missing many things. <laughs> this is my take, right? We're really missing many things. Because out of the schools came very important uh, defamiliarizations, okay? Now, uh, to, to kind of, um, push the point a little, I'm going to take you very briefly to a 17th century uh, autobiography, the first of its kind, and I believe the only one of its kind, right? Written by a, a Jaina merchant called Banarasidas. The text was called Artha Kathanaka. I'm not going to bore you with, with a long excerpts from Banarasidas. <laughs> But Artha Katanaka was an amazing autobiography, right, which actually showed how a very sharp mind, right, okay, it's not actually written by a stupid man, right, a very, very sharp mind, was looking at childhood, was looking at pedagogy, what he was actually, um, what he was actually uh, reading, right? He was looking at his caste affiliation, right? And he was uh, looking at his own thirst for knowledge. Okay, since he was a Jaina merchant, he mentions very ironically that his family, uh, especially his father and his male kin group. Uh, felt that he really shouldn't be studying grammar, rhetoric, Sanskrit uh, shlokas, um, because those were for Brahmins. They were for Brahmin priests. What would a Jaina merchant boy do with such uh, esoteric knowledge? Um, he also he also mentioned uh, in the same in the same breath that he was um, writing poetry. Uh, he was um, uh, writing, um, you know, he was writing uh, erotic poetry. Woof, right? Okay, and he was uh, hankering after the life of the mind, which was not really his caste calling. Okay, we also get in in passing. Um, we also get a certain kind of uh, uh, training, educational training, which does not turn on schools. These were uh, private 
one to one or maybe um, three or four or five to one, one being the teacher, the four to five uh, young people being the, the, um, the shishyas. And uh, the um, merchants, again from his slightly ironical reference, the merchants should be happy with mathematics certain understanding of arithmetic mathematics and the basic writing skills, right? So this is Banarasi Das, uh, who uh, later on became quite a big religious leader, right? So he is actually talking about a caste-dominated um, uh, uh, training uh, in education, but he is not talking about schools. He is not talking about common educational programs. He is not talking about a general location within the world. He is only talking about a certain uh, location within a literate uh, tradition. And he says that even this location is questioned by a caste group, where literacy, please do remember that the Jainas were highly literate communities across the Indian subcontinent very, very mobile uh, and highly literate. And he was talking about such a literate community also being restricted in the way they understood uh, literacy, right? So this is not a democratic or a mass educational program that we are talking about. And neither are we talking about a state intervention in educational programs. These were very tightly limited to caste groups. When we shift the scale suddenly to colonial India, especially from the late 18th century, we see some very strange rufflings. We see some very strange reshufflings of disorder. Because we find, for the first time, uh, the state, actually not the state, shall we call it a governance, shall we call it an administrative, uh, an administration? Because I don't think the, if this was the colonial state as we understand a state today, right? Okay, so this particular governance, understanding of government, understanding of administration, had a certain understanding, had a certain cognitive take on how it should approach massification of abilities, right? And uh, that is only because, as we students of history all know, this was only because it would cut the company's costs to have native trained employees, right? Which is the reason why there had to be this massification program which would teach one and the same thing to a fairly large number of students. This was one of the most important reasons why a new deep structure called the school, right, okay, became a new entrant. Shall we call it a new political economy? Because this took the indigenous literate communities by surprise. Honestly, I think it did because these schools were some, doing something very different. These schools were defamiliarizing the mind of a child from the family and placing it within a very different rule-bound structure, which was the school. Against this, and this is something that I have actually mentioned through the reports that I have been citing, um, uh, uh, like talismans, right? Okay, we, are, we cannot just talk about arguments. We have to substantiate each and every claim we make in an argument by evidence, right? Historians, unfortunately, are very unfortunate people. <laughs> We really have to uh, say things, right, with, with, with solid, with very solid data. And these schooling, these new ways of schooling the child, right, comes from uh, obviously the West, but it also comes with a <clears throat> different reading of time, a different understanding of, of, of uh, 
systems, pedagogic systems, but much more importantly, it combines structurally and psychologically the mind and the body together. By the <clears throat> 18th century, last stages of the 18th century, by the time we get our presidency college, Hindu school, by the time we get our hair school, certain very important frames have fallen into place. And these frames are the classrooms and the ordering of classrooms and a playground. I have actually cited, um, uh, so yeah, so a playground is an extremely important framing of the body along with some very um, strange uh, games, right, okay. Um, I have been to the Oriental Seminary and they actually had a long chapter and verse to talk about the first kick on the football, right? So these are very important uh, initiations, if you like, right, into the, uh, uh, the way the mind and the body are regulated by a defamiliarizing um, uh, strategy, right, which would place the child away from the family and into a competitive modern environment, okay? I think, and this is my, again, this is my personal take, please do tell me, I can get carried away, right, okay, please do tell me when it is time to go home. Um, So when we are talking about um, uh, males in these defamiliarizing structures called schools and playgrounds, we also need to understand that uh, some of the reactions to girls' schooling perhaps came from this reluctance, really deep reluctance, which we haven't as yet nailed, right, okay, to make girls get defamiliarized with the family, right? So I feel that the, the surrounding of the school, right? I, uh, something was going very, uh, I think something was going on here, right? Which we really haven't nailed as it were in an academic fashion. How is it that uh, education, the, the slogan, education is all right, but no school? That's also one of the most important 19th century um, uh, agendas, right, of, of uh, even social reformers, right, where, where girls are, uh, are, of course, very restricted in a very, very restricted way. way. Girls are uh, seen to have, uh, have, have some uh, right or maybe they should have some uh, way of getting educated. But, but uh, why school? Right, so there is this very uh, big question mark on the school, right? And and of course, uh, girls going out, girls being stared at by strangers, all these are very uh, standard uh, complaints, right? But there is also, I think, a deeper cultural unease with the fact that women who are seen to be, women and little girls, who are seen to be part of the domestic, should not actually be uh, disaggregated from the domestic in a different uh, in a different structural space, which would give them a slightly different orientation to peer groups and communities, right? Not the family, peer groups and communities, right? Okay. So this is this is, I think, uh, 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 also a point of resistance which we have not really appreciated enough. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so now let me come to um, the point where not just the deep structures of the schools but also the way in which uh, the West is translated into uh, the everyday language of textbooks, right? Okay. 
I kind of feel that, again, we have um, not really addressed translation as a very important political action. I think translations are very important. Uh, in a quick aside, let me also say that um, uh, what we uh, see as um, the developed world, say for example uh, Italy or say for example Japan, uh, actually uh, have a book market which catches each and every international bestseller or any uh, well-known international author and almost instantly these books are translated into the vernaculars, right? There is, therefore, a very strong uh, catching of the world through the vernacular, okay? And I think this is a very important political act. And in Bengal, we see a very similar uh, reaction to the West. And we see that uh, though there is obviously a lot of translation for the adult world, but there is, and our um, very own Ishwa Chandra Vidya Sagar, uh, Madhushudhan Mukhopadhyay, uh, and uh, Akshay Kumar Dat, uh, Tatta Bodhini Patrika, okay, were some of the pioneers in the works of translations from uh, very ordinary textbooks from um, uh, the West. The facticity of the world, and, and what facts? Uh, the fact that the world has um, a tilted axis that it spins, that the monsoons are actually because of uh, uh, m m uh, a very important physical uh, m m factor, right? Okay, uh, that, that there is uh, high pressure, there is low pressure. The winds are are because of that. There is something called gravity, which which makes these uh, planets re revolve around the uh, uh, sun, right? Now. Um, while, uh, again, I, I don't really want to get into political agendas, while there is a certain emphasis in today's uh, version of nationalism, that there is, um, you know, a very strong uh, scientific, uh, you know, basis uh, to the so-called ancient Indian civilization, right? Read Hindu civilization. Uh, there is, uh, and of course, there is a huge uh, set of, uh, a body of evidence which shows that the uh, mathematical knowledge uh, and, and uh, a physical, a cosmic understanding of, the, of, of space was highly developed. The problem is, and, and I suggest we think about these before really uh, making ourselves an international laughing stock. We think we we did not have a general, a popular um, a take on these very esoteric knowledge systems, right? So these were definitely part of a very thin, a very very thin slice of 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 scholarly community uh, at 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 obviously at at various points in time but they never really translated into a popular uh, awareness a massification if you like of knowledge systems there was no such massification okay and and uh, therefore and and i would like to make this um So I would like to say that uh, there is a, a shock. A, shall we call it an, an intellectual as well as a culture shock? To suddenly have uh, the material, uh, uh, you know, the material descriptions, thick descriptions of the world, which are, and this is happening to Akshay Kumar Dutt, this is happening to Madhushudhan Datta. This is happening to Ram Mohan Roy. This is happening to the various uh, people who are manning the Datta Bodhini Patrika and the Datta Bodhini Sabha in the 1840s, right? Just think about it. Datta is fact. Bodhini. And somewhere, if you look at uh, similar sabhas and samitis coming up in Maharashtra, in the West, in the uh, South, uh, everything deals with 
fact finding fact consciousness of facts why is it coming only with the colonial advent why right so obviously in spite of having a fairly uh, in fact a very very deep uh, understanding of the world of mathematics and astrology uh, and astro astronomy astrology kind of uh, slipping one into the other right i kind of uh, would like to make a very clear argument that um, these were uh, separated by a sea of illiteracy okay which banarasi das is telling you how you know in what way it was perpetrated it was perpetrated with a certain kind of literacy right which would not allow a peek into into a, a different world of knowledge systems it was not necessary it really was not necessary and therefore it was uh, and we have uh, uh, propullo chandru uh, shen right okay who had actually with his take on uh, chemistry pardon me if i'm wrong but this is precisely what he had said right that there is a a, a strong uh, a division between um, uh, a theory and the way ordinary people came to understand um, you know chemistry Right? there was no understanding because there was no connect between between a theoretical take and the and the um uh, um okay um and the everyday uh, knowledge systems right okay which was completely disjunct there was there was no connection at all so this is his take on uh, hindu chemistry um the history of hindu uh, chemistry Uh, which was seen to be a very strongly nationalist work okay so th this is what the english schooling system does it massifies geography as a knowledge system it massifies uh, history as a general model you know modern modern uh, system of education pedagogical pedagogical strategy of identifying who you are where you come from what is the history of your region how you have uh, understood political developments and so on uh, dresses and cultural features of the region uh, things like that right so therefore we are looking at a new orientation okay and this orientation is a uh, hammered home and this hammering is caught in the reports which i have cited to show you uh, or to show the seeing reader how map drawing and how locating uh, your your uh, location is beginning to become very important as a um, definition of the self um this is and this is what akshay kumar datto uh, i will say it in bengali akshay kumar datto uh, ishwar chandra vidyashagor translate akshay kumar datto i would like to at some point after i have uh, gracefully i hope retired from academics i would like to turn him into a fictional figure because somewhere i find uh, akshay kumar datto one of the most fascinating uh, historical figures who seems to be running against time somewhere i feel that uh, because he wrote like a demon he translated texts like like somebody possessed and he was translating uh, from the 1830s way way before ishwar chandra vidyashagar okay uh, uh, all through uh, he was part of the tatva bodhini bodhini patrika he was he was um, he, the secretary and uh, what the time that was not taken up by his tatva uh, nipot tatva bodhini patrika uh, and tatva bodhini shabha duties was all spent um, uh, you know translating uh, so he is translated a set of geographical factors called bhugol in 18 okay so we are actually looking at uh, a person who understood the importance of of speeding up time uh, he really was running with the with the hands of the clock and trying to speed up the hands of the clock and make it catch up with western time 
right? And uh, um, he died of overwork. Literally, he flogged himself to death. Literally, because he almost collapsed over his desk. So I'm talking about this kind of dislocation and the feeling of anxiety that it produced in 19th century Bengal. And I would like to think, right, if there are similar um, uh, studies coming up in the rest of uh, the linguistic uh, regions of India, I would like to think that this is a similar anxiety felt by literate communities for the first time being hid in the solar plexus, right, with a strange body of uh, thick descriptions of the world, of, the spa of space, of time, which they hadn't grappled with ever. Right, and this makes geography, I think, one of the most ironical disciplines of all, because this is shoved into the, uh, 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 you know, into the into the heads of uh, children, into into the heads of youngsters, and the discipline comes in colonial Bengal with a very strange um, awareness. As you discover the global world, you discover that the center has moved away from you. It is there in the West. The center is not with you at all, right? And you are dispossessed of your center. You are the periphery. As you read your geography lessons, you imbibe with it your peripheral location. I think that is one of the most important colonizing moments, even in the mind of a child. All right. The fact that there is a center and a periphery which is created simultaneously, right? Okay, and I think this comes with geographies. And I would like to. So I will complete. Uh, uh, um, I will round it off. I would like to say that Hemendra Kumar Roy does something really brilliant, right? Which is of course followed by uh, uh, our other greats like Satyajitre. Right, he does something really brilliant, which is that he places Vimalan Kumar, he places Jayantamanik, right, as the center. They're not peripheries. Right? They are discovering their own geographies, they are discovering their own, uh, uh, you know, their own centers, right? And the West actually is cut out. This is a fictive move, see? Right? Fiction allows you to do in the very heart of the colonial uh, empire, right? Fiction allows you to centralize yourself, right? So your geographies familiarize you with terrains. It familiarizes you with, with apes and gorillas and all kinds, of, all kinds of wild spaces. But it also can allow you to bypass the center periphery, um, um, you know, bifurcation. And it can allow uh, the Bengali fictional imagination, Hemendra Kumar Roy, which is perhaps one of the reasons why uh, Hemendra Kumar Roy's Vimalan Kumar became so famous. Because there is this simultaneous appreciation of a peripheral location, but there is also this, this, this possibility of bypassing it. So it is, of course, a world of uh, 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 the masculine imagination, sure. I mean, Hemendra Kumar Roy doesn't make uh, any bones about it. He he says that I want to make more manly, more more uh, uh, more more uh, adventurous, uh, uh, less scaredy cats, um, uh, you know, boys and men, uh, uh, and and uh, that also from Bengal. Uh, so Hemendra Kumar Roy, across a whole series of essays does two things with his with his uh, history and geography it, geographically fictively he places the bengali at the center and historically he constantly pulls out uh, examples of a fighting bengali and punches the two together and he says that you know uh, history proves that the Bengali had always been a fighter. Shoshanku, for instance, right? Okay, so he actually constantly uses geography to keep bringing back the fighting, the masculine Bengali, back into the center stage, right? And his fiction allows the flying past moment across a caste-ridden, constrained, upper caste male body. Thank you.
um, I think I would I would uh, break the ice with with the question is you see the you you mentioned Hemendra Kumar Rai and and I'm thinking of all the children's literature, especially the boys' own kind of literature produced in the West. Uh, think of the Treasure Island and the um, Lost uh, World, Lost World, <laughs> and Swal Swallows and Amazons, especially those involving children, like Children sure, of New sure. Forest, boys, boys. Swiss Family Robinson, yeah. etc., etc. And in a sense, these are. I'm just keeping lost world out of it for the moment because it doesn't have children as such, right? Yeah. Uh, the, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the protagonist is, is a grown-up reporter, right? Okay, so, but the boys' own kind of adventure stories in the West, which we all grew up reading, uh, has these typical themes like shipwrecks, you know, of, of, of sailing, along by mistake or by design and then getting shipwrecked and then being confronted by pirates of all kinds and then eventually triumphing, eventually eventually winning the game because in a sense they have, they are, in a, in, in a very broad sense, they are empire's children. Yeah, they, sure. are, they are the children of people uh, and they are the children who would become, become the men who would go out into the colonies. So, and if we sort of compare these with the, the, the geographical terrains explored by in, in Bengali fiction, Hemendra Kumar Rai is an obvious example because, um, you know, Bimal also is very, very central to this politics of the body because I remember, <laughs> you know, at the outset of Jokher Dhan, Bimal is I think cleaning his gun or something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, when when you see Bimal, uh, he is uh, this this very masculine, young and brave man who is who is just casually uh, cleaning his gun with 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 a cleaning rod or, or something like that. So, and and Abar Jokhardhan is I think uh, I think modeled on King Solomon's mines. Uh, broadly speaking, and and he's all the Shokokar Kandu is actually a lift rip off sure, yeah. from. Emil and the detectives and Emil sure, and the Sure, sure, absolutely. So, but, uh, you know, so is it, you know, th this, this is, so the, the children's li adventure stories in the West are based on a kind of self-image that has a connection to the real facts of empire and colonies sure. and, and a few white men actually uh, running these empires of, of huge, of, of, of millions of people. So is the placement of these Bengali males uh, uh, of, uh, of an expanding world at, as a centerpiece, is this something, and this is completely diverse from reality. So is this, is this something aspirational? Is this something rhetorically uh, trying to, you know, it's, it's just, just, just like, it, is it something akin to the, the argument of, say, Partho Chatterjee, that because you are unable to cope with the subjugation in the political and economic world, which is a real subjugation, <laughs> therefore, you, you sort of dream up and fashion together a domain of the home in which you win because our women are... So is this a rhetorical strategy, an aspirational strategy that sort of is something, you know, it is living in denial and, and, and sure. aspirational and it, 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 countering the West. Yeah. I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm also thinking of why, why do you think, you know, I, I, would, I would make sense of the adventure stories in, in all, all of these, all of these, uh, you know, worlds of, of, of dark, savage barbarians and pirates. But why is this Bengali fascination with Africa and why is, uh, you know, you have Chandir Pahar, you have uh, Avar Jokhir Dhan, Rabindranath Tagore, you know, uh, of all things writes this long poem about... Uh, uh, Africa. 
I would Africa, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so why, 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 and and and, 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 and you know, this, I'm thinking of this famous scene in Potter Pachali where Opu cries, Africa. And, and, so why, why, you know, but what kind of location, right. intellectually, what kind of location sure, uh, sure. Uh, that that? It's uh, okay, uh, thank you. I mean, really, a whole bunch of questions. But first, let me also uh, uh, say that. Uh, I'm not the only person who has worked on uh, uh, childhood. Uh, uh, Shivaji Pantapathas, Gopal yes, Rakhal, Nanda Shamash has also looked at this aspirational uh, uh, imperialism uh, uh, as, as the Bengali authors exhibit. Um, uh, especially him and Rukumar Roy and um, uh, Modhushudhan uh, Mukhopadhyay and others. Yes, I, I mean, it has been said. So uh, Africa, of course, is, um, but I have a, I have a, I can pip uh, uh, Shivaji Bandhapadhyay on that because I feel that it is also, Himendra Kumar Roy is also a, a free translation. So while you have Vidya Sagar and, um, um, you know, um, um, Madhushudan Mukhopadhyay uh, translating voraciously from, from Western primers, from Western um, uh, moral, moral stories, uh, ethical stories, and presenting a new individual uh, in, in the vernacular. Uh, um, but precise, very, very, um, uh, very, very um, authentic, very, very attempting to at least, very, very uh, correct uh, a translation of one culture, one climate, one, um, you know, uh, uh, different kinds of individualism, different understandings of effort of, of uh, acquiring um, uh, by oneself a, a new world, uh, aspirations, if you like. The power to dream. I think Madhushudan uh, Mukhopadhyay and Ishwachandra uh, uh, and, of course, Akshay Akhoi Kumadatta were, were daring the Bengalis to dream. They were giving them a different understanding of aspiration. Um, and I think these were much more uh, aimed at also adult worlds, right? Much more, uh, much more for, their, for their understanding of the power to dream uh, and, of, and, and uh, the, 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 uh, um, the importance of wanting to have a different future from the one that has been chalked out for you uh, by your community. Um, so this is, this is, I think, the aspirational dreaming that the first set of translators are trying to put in place in textbooks and in the massification of education through schooling, a new deep structure being pushed into the society, Bengali stratified caste-dominated society. Against this, uh, Hemendra Kumar Roy will be providing free translations where uh, the names of the European protagonists will be changed to Bengali names, where the most striking features of the European protagonists would be would be given, uh, you know, to to um, to Bengali uh, protagonists. So there is a certain taking over, appropriation of of uh, the features which belong to an imperialist uh, Western discourse, because these are also discourses, uh, not just about um, uh, children's stories, but the children's stories as you very rightly point out, children's stories also take on from uh, real life, um, uh, from real life, uh, um, um, uh, shall I say, endeavors, right, okay? Uh, so uh, in, my, um, in the fourth chapter of the book, I do this. I look at how, <coughs> I look at how um, the, the, the people who undertake voyages, especially in the 17th and the 18th century, explain their motives for their voyages to Africa, uh, uh, exploring the Nile, uh, uh, wanting to, um, wanting to uh, record uh, the, the true home of the gorilla, right? You know, so you actually have, so this is Du Shailu. Okay, this, this particular um, uh, illustration was produced by Du Shailu. Du Shailu uh, is, is actually one of the uh, most um, 
oft or shall we call it the most referred names in Upendra Kishore Roy Choudhury's um, uh, essays. Because yes, and uh, Upendra Kishore Roy Choudhury um, uh, constantly reproduces the illustrations that uh, Western, um, uh, you know, Western texts, Western uh, narratives uh, produce on, you know, strange animals, on on dangerous animals like gorillas, like apes. So you do have a congruence uh, before before Hemendra Kumar Roy actually becomes uh, uh, this this. Uh, Free translator of Western of Western um, environment of Western protagonists into an Indian idiom. Shall we call it a Bengali idiom? Uh, you have the groundwork laid down by a whole range of of uh, uh, intellectuals who have um, uh, 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 who have one foot in the Western world and what the Western world is discovering, another foot in the uh, uh, technology they can. And they can uh, bring over to uh, uh, you know to Bengal. I I can only talk in terms of Bengal. I don't know the histories of other regions. Okay, so you have Upendra Kishore and Shottujitra comes directly from this line. Right, the discovering of the West through photography, through technology, through um, different mediums. Right, so you have you have Shottujitra directly connected. And therefore, his uh, uh, creative over uh, is is uh, definitely part of this this uh, um, I think this arch, this intellectual and and imaginative arch, uh, uh, which is also a free translation of the West. Shotujitra, I, I I I know he's a great man, right? Okay. Uh, I mean, surely I uh, how can, being a Bengali, I can't uh, you know deny that, but. Uh, there is also a familiarity in the Feluda stories, which are very close to the uh, Hemendra, uh, uh, Hemendra Kumar Roy kind of stories. Right? You know, uh, I'm not saying that he was not creative. Some of his stories are, um, uh, you know, are are really different uh, and and uh, uh, you know, unique in many ways. But his uh, Heluda Topesh um, uh, is, uh, together with Lal Mohan Babu, is a, a facsimile, I would say, of uh, uh, Jayanto Manik and Shundar Babu. I, I do not really see too much of a difference between these tableaus and the, uh, uh, you know, the 1930s tableaus, right? Except that one is colonial, the other is post-colonial, right? So I, I would, I would. Uh, I would say that these are free translations, but I feel that these are also freedoms in a way, because uh, uh, they explore freedoms too. These are not just imitations, these are just not mimicries, but they are also um, uh, a way to be. So you t you got me thinking about hundreds of things, <laughs> but I'll uh, limit myself a, to a very s small question. Um, so I'm trying to look at it a little more sinister way. Um, so what I am thinking of is that perhaps the colonial uh, times are central to this way of, um, you know, whether it's translation, it's writing, and so forth. So let me begin uh, what I think is the beginning, which is Sherlock Holmes. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm a Sherlock Holmes fanatic. Fan. <laughs> um, one of the very interesting things about Sherlock Holmes is that if starting his story if you find that there is a character who has been to the colonies, you can be sure that that is the murderer. Sign of four. All of them. Yes. There's no exception. Okay. I've gone through the whole thing. And so it is the English gentleman who is innocent. But it is the um, colonial. Uh, colonial Englishman who brings back the evil of the East or the colonies back and does all these horrible things. 
So, uh, in some sense, what I'm thinking about is a classification scheme. You call, call it, you know, caste structure or whatever it is. It's a new version. So, there is the West, which is uh, the most civilized. And, uh, pardon my politically incorrect statement, Africa, which is savage. And India is desperately trying to occupy the middle position. Okay, so this is my reading of this structure. And since uh, he mentioned Chandir Pahar, I'll mention the other Vibhutivushan story, which is Arun Nok. Yes, oh, yeah, I absolutely. <laughs> okay, so, uh, I mean, one is almost like the mirror image of the other. But what is common? What is common is that, you know, if you take Shankar's uh, Black Mamba instead of your gorilla uh, and Africa and then this character I in Loptulia Buihar, whatever. This it, it appears to me that it is a uh, the in the Bengali elite recognizing that a huge advancement of knowledge has happened in the in the West is trying to catch up desperately as you point out, and uh, perhaps it's this uh, trying to find ourselves as we are not quite as savage as the Africans, although we are not quite the equal of the West, uh, which you know, produces many of these uh, efforts to get out in the middle space before that space disappears. So I, I, this is, there are many other things that you had said which uh, I find fascinating and perhaps we could discuss, but this is just a different sure. take on this uh, you know, fascination with Africa, fascination with the lesser developed parts of the country, the look at the West, the constant, you know, for example, uh -oh. uh, Holmes, Watson and Lestrade, Straight out, uh, you know, uh, and and even Jota, you. Yeah, uh, you know, that's in a different true. Way, uh, so. but as I said, these are free translations. But but uh, I also have thought about the um, the savaging of the savage in the Bengali fictive genre. It, the, the the Africans, the uh, the barbaric um, you know, Papua Guineans, oh, everyone seems to be uh, framed. But you know, I will say why I kind of left it out a bit because these have been again uh, um, part of the uh, Shivaji Bondopadhyay frame. Uh, he also had looked at the um, uh, uh, racist and the highly um, imperialistic frame of the Indian, especially the colonial writers, um, and, and uh, Africa, non-Western non cultures, uh, which is, of course, standing in stark um, uh, contrast to the sophistication of the Indians, right? Okay, so there is this, there is this uh, uh, triangulation, if you like, where the West is the apex, but uh, India is the space which is very definitely far, far superior to the other other non-Western barbaric savage cultures. Yeah, that is that is. Uh, but at some points, you will find that Himendra Kumar Roy is making efforts to uh, bridge that gap where uh, Indians and the West actually come very close together as as uh, uh, you know imperial powers. That's where history, I would say is a very important role. You will find Angkor Wat actually mooring Hemendra Kumar's uh, historical takes on, uh, yes, on the Hindu imperialistic Vibhuti past. Too. Yeah, and no? Vibhuti Bhushan too. Imperialistic past. They are also saying that we have also been imperialists, not just you, right? <laughs> yeah, so there is this very strange, that's, that's why I say the geography and history, right, are the two moorings, right, which, which kind of... Uh, places India and the Hindu, of, of the Indians, the Hindu, as the, as the imperialistic, as the imperialistic center of the ancient world. 
I could not mention everything in my, yeah. uh, you know, but in I, my I, book. I, I was actually going to mention uh, Aronno. Shobhashi just said it because, you know, I, just I was thinking that when you have uh, Aronnok and Bhutivishan's other uh, excursions into into the India's interior, that is also very colonial because that kind of travel was made possible by the uh, expansion of communications and so on and so forth. And what you have in Bhutivishan is not is 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 a is something different from the cosmic geographies of the pre-modern uh, oh, pre-British. Oh, oh, totally. Yes, but I mean, uh, yes, but but Bhutivishan also, you know, while exploring Loptulia Bihar and you know Talkobad and all all these all these Saranda forests and you know, all 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 these areas, is uh, it, you know it's it and that that is all is he so he is. His, his encounters with Indi India's deep recesses of interior geography, he also ends up being some kind of an internal and Indian anthropologist looking at facts, oh, yes. you know, looking at these tropes of tribal simplicity uh, and you know uh, oh, yes. uh, and, uh, yeah yeah so. So it's 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 the other it, it's the, uh, uh, the it's the Englishman's it's a Bengali Englishman's look at India I guess sort the, of yes sort of, uh, it's yeah, tr yeah. it's well true um, well that's true um, but um, as I said I could not handle everything in the book sure, so this is where I'm taking the ideas forward right okay yeah I have a very brief question uh, if I can remember correctly. Uh, Hemendra Kumar Rai, in one of his uh, stories, there is a woman character called Minu. Mm. It's in Shurjo Nagari Gupta Dhan. Mm. Oh, in two, uh, so actually, Himalaya Bhayankar. Himalaya Bhayankar is Minu, uh, yeah, is there. So how would you place a character like Minu in his advent? Actually, advent I have series? placed her already. <laughs> you know, she's, I find, actually, I find it one of the most... Uh, you know, um, if you actually look at uh, Hemendra Kumar Rai's uh, genre, uh, I find that uh, Shurjo Naguri uh, Gupta, Gupta Dhon and, and Himalaya Bhayankar bringing in Minu in, in, um, in the storyline uh, actually gives us this very strange, um, uh, you know, uh, Bengali um, stereotypical take on uh, the woman as either the goddess or the whore, okay? Uh, in Shurjo Nagarir uh, Gupta Dhun, right, you find that Rinu has been abducted by the Incas to be the uh, Inca, Inca um, uh, priestess, right, okay? I mean, the, the wife of the Inca king, right, okay? Uh, so you can she has to be saved by uh, uh, yeah so she uh, also also she has to be the goddess right okay even in uh, himalaya bhayankar um, uh, there is this the, you know a very typical fictive anthropological take on how um, dogs are worshipped by savages and uh, women uh, abducted women become the priestesses of those of those communities so himalaya so these these uh, so called yetis right who are the uh, the uh, abom abominable snowmen right okay who are kind of um, the villains in this particular story uh, abduct minu to be a goddess right okay and a dog to be the to be um, sorry sorry the dog to be the god and the uh, abducted female to be the priestess of the god okay so the the twist is Bagha is the dog that that, that becomes the god and and uh, Rinu uh, becomes the priestess, right? So things fall rather neatly in place. But there is a major infantilization of the women, okay, as, as we encounter them in these masculine adventure tropes. Because she is irresponsible, she runs away, she has no sense of discipline, right? She has only two words which uh, are her descriptions of a very so-called tense situation, which is, oh, ma, ki moja. <laughs> I, I, I found it, I found it infuriating. <laughs> right, that's the only thing she can say, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's, 
I, I found, I found uh, the infantilization of the woman's presence in a man's world uh, uh, actually the only way in which she could be incorporated in this world. You cannot give her rationality. You, you cannot even give her courage because she doesn't know what's happening. She only thinks of so she. She has so um, she has so little uh, knowledge of the consequences of these abductions, of these kid kidnappings that she, um, uh, you know, she shows her uh, bravery by by saying that oh well, you know, it, it was it was great fun. <laughs> It's different from Holmes's world. Uh, oh, totally. Yeah, there yeah. is no there is no appreciation of what's happening to her. Only men can appreciate what's happening to her, right? <laughs> so I, I'm sorry. I found Shujun no, one of the worst of. Uh, it was actually a torture wading through that lot. But, but particularly tiresome was this particular story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> any other questions from? Yes. Yes. Namaskar, ma'am. Actually, our no question ni bolar, kintu our bhishon bhal legeshi. Apna re lecture ta shune. Actually, amra gato kisu din thore ekta mani mani ekta mani filme ra utte theki amra ekhane shobai jodi to hotchi, shobai ekhane aschi. Ebom tar modde apna je ei je illustration ta ei je lecture ta, shita amar mone hotchi. Eto shundor ekta flavour diye galo. Jeita mone hotchi je new minds, new bodies. Jeita apni bolchein. আমার মনে হচ্ছে যে আমরা যেমন ধরুন একটা ওয়েদার যখন আমরা দেখি খুব গরম পড়ছে প্রচন্ড তাপ ভীষণ কষ্টে সবাই আছে তারপর একটা খুব জোরে একটা ঝোড়ো হাওয়া দিল একটা মানে তুফান যেটাকে বলে সেটা আসলো এবং সেই তুফানের পর যখন বৃষ্টিটা হলো তখন কিন্তু মাটিটা কিন্তু আবার নতুন জীবনটাকে জন্ম দেওয়ার জন্য তৈরি হয়ে গেল হুম এই যে জিনিসটা যেটা বেঙ্গল অ্যান্ড কলোনিয়াল জিওগ্রাফি এই যে মানে আপনি যে ক্যাপশনটা যেটা আছে সেটা আমার মনে হচ্ছে এটা খুবই অ্যাপ্রোপ্রিয়েট সেইভাবে করে যে হ্যাঁ আমরা ওই তিনশো বছর সাড়ে তিনশো বছরের যে যা কিছু ভোগ করলাম তারও আগে থেকে যেটা হাজার বছর মানে সেটা বলতে গেলে যে একটা মানে টার্মোয়ালের টাইমটা গেল তারপর কিন্তু এখনই যে টাইমটা আছে খুবই ঠান্ডা টাইম আছে এবং এই টাইমে কিন্তু সত্যি নিউ আইডিয়াজ আর ভীষণ যেটাকে কিন্তু খুবই যেটাকে বলা হয় একদম মানে মানে যেটাকে বলা হয় জার্স এ মজবুত এই জিনিসটা কিন্তু গ্রো করার জন্য একদম পারফেক্ট টাইমিং তাই না মনে তো হচ্ছে খুব সুন্দর লাগলো আপনার এই কথাটা থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাংক ইউ হোয়াট শি মিন্স টু সে দ্যাট উই হ্যাভ বিন ডুইং দিস উইকলি ফিল্ম স্ক্রিনিংস অন গান্ধি ফর কোয়াইট সাম টাইম নাও সো আই থিঙ্ক Uh, many of us in the hall do come to those film screenings so we have we have had a you know quite enough of gandhi so thank you for giving us the gorilla <laughs> and breaking the monotony of <laughs> thank you <laughs> so <laughs> well thank you for giving me the privilege of speaking here it was wonderful thank you very much I, uh, if i bother you one more thing because it just stirred so many thoughts in my head and it's about this Uh, the adventurous uh, bengali and it seems to me that uh, to not mention ghonada would be a oh mistake. but i have ghonada again and again <laughs> oh, okay you have okay. <laughs> no but but, but ghonada is a very strange twist yes he, yes he of gives course, you yes. the macho uh, male but then at the end of it it's a lie yeah of course <laughs> But, you know, <laughs> I, I, I have given Ghanada. But, uh, but I just want, I, uh, I professionally I'm a scientist. And I actually went through some of these Ghanada stories. Yes, and of course, right? it's science absolutely is absolutely accurate. accurate. That, that science is absolutely yes, accurate. Yes, yes. And <laughs> that's the trick. Yes. That you think this man is just bluffing. Yeah. And the yeah, environment yeah. is set for tall tales. and it is of course a tall tale and ghanada isn't the first man on mount everest but everything else around it the, all the scientific facts and the, even the formula of chlor chlorophyll yeah. everything is correct yeah uh, well but that is the beauty of the ghanada stories right you know uh, uh, by by the 1950s 1960s uh, 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 science has become ours right and uh, the masculinity is a fiction <laughs> so i think i think this is what premendra uh, premendra mitra does right he actually says well we appropriate the science and we laugh at the masculinity 
Yeah, but but it is very interesting that you know the the Ganada's fiction, you know, sitting in that maze body of Bhattu number Bhunawali Noshkur Lane, and I mean, but he had done his homework to get his scientific facts right. You know, Shatrujit Rai in his Shonku stories had not bothered. You know, he could build a robot for Tinsho Tetrishtaka Barwana or make a robot <laughs> sing Dhanodhanu Pushpa Vada. True, uh, true. Uh, but you know, so that is a, that, that, that is a leap of the imagination. But Premendra Mitra sounds so convincing. It, it could have been all but, so true. But <laughs> so I can true. also say yes. that Premendra Mitra is a laugh. After the Hemendro Roy and uh, uh, you know the the uh, build up of the the Bengali masculinity, so what I think, uh, and this is what I say in my book, that uh, the Bengali finally with Premendra Mitra, because he is one of the most popular writers too. Premendra Mitra has a, and to, even today he has a huge fan following. Me being one, right? Okay, so um, uh, he seems to have. Uh, uh, combined uh, uh, Western science, right, uh, with a laugh for the Bengali fictive male masculinity, because because this is what he is laughing at. He's putting every trick Hemendra Kumar Roy uses, right, for the uh, Ghanada stories, including the West, the the aping of the Western strongman. So you see a lot of Raymond Chandler, um, especially the mimic of the style. Uh, <laughs> no, that's that's a parody of uh, uh, that's a co completely yes. Yeah, uh -huh. the, the tough man. So the it's a it's a it's a different kind of politics. It's a different politics. A, a totally different. If politics. if Hemendra Kumar Rai etc were aspirational, uh, you know, G G he makes fun of Premendra Mitra makes fun of it because absolutely it's he he is uh, he is mocking he is yes. mocking at these notions of masculinity yes. right so he says let's be real for a change right and then and I like the I like the turn uh, you have Ghanada uh, doing exactly what Bimal does doing exactly what Jayanto does and then everything turns out to be you know to be a, to be one of the biggest you know good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's the entire premise is that yes, it's yes, yes. But that it's a good story. Yes, N of uh, course. Yeah, absolutely. and also correct, absolutely. perfectly correct. Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah. So, do you have a question? Okay. So uh, I think I think we had a, a very interesting, very engaging uh, round of discussion. So uh, and thank you so much, Anindita, for giving us so much, so many thoughts to to live with and ponder and maybe come back and... and uh, I would love to. <laughs> yes, uh, and, and discuss them once more. So, uh, thank all of you for coming here. So, please join me in thanking Professor Anindita Thank you so much. Thank you.